The scene opens in 1948 at the entrance of Harlem Prep Academy. The school day was over and the students were running to get outside to play. As the crowd thins, we notice a small albino boy carrying a guitar case that was as big as he was. Now that alone would be an attention getter, but unlike other albinos whose skin tones have little or no pigments, his skin was bright pink. This was Floyd Watkins. Throughout school, Floyd was treated different. Because he was smart, musically talented, and would learn very quickly, his teachers treated him special. Other students were jealous, and as a result, he was bullied. When Floyd finally got home, he was bruised and feeling bad. After bandaging his wounds and soothing his pain, his grandma, who owned Cafe Society Uptown, the top entertainment spot in Harlem, told her grandson about an old musician's superstition. Playing music with an albino musician brings good luck. Her wise advice was, you're a very talented musician and you also happen to be an albino. So if you always hang out with other musicians and people who love music, you can avoid this problem. Floyd's parents were nightclub performers who were on the road a lot. His grandma watched Floyd when his parents were traveling. Her nightclub was his playground. He got friendly with the members of the house band. He loved to watch them play and listen to them as they rehearsed. Floyd had a natural talent for any instrument he picked up. By the time he entered high school, he played piano, drums, clarinet, saxophone, and bass. But his favorite instrument was the guitar. After rehearsals, some of the band members at his grandmother's cafe would hang out and jam. As Floyd grew into his teens, he was sometimes asked to join them. Here it was safe, but at school the bullying continued. So his parents decided to take him on the road with them. The best lesson Floyd got was how to avoid trouble when on the road in the Deep South. His parents knew all the back roads where the likelihood of being pulled over was rare. As a plus, Floyd filled in as part of the house bands when his parents were performing. When Floyd turned 18, he returned to New York and worked at his grandma's club. Because of his multi-instrument talent, he joined the band every night, filling in for no-show musicians. He got to accompany the biggest star performers of the day, Ella Fitzgerald, Jimmy Ruffing, and Billy Holiday, to name a few. Floyd's favorite performers were the bluesmen, T-Bone Walker, Howling Wolf, and Screamin' Jay Hawkins. After each performance, Floyd would try to play their music exactly the way they did, but it didn't sound the same. Something was missing. One night after Floyd had finished backing up the legendary bluesman Muddy Waters, Floyd was sitting on a crate in the alley behind the club strumming his guitar. Out came the great blues man himself. He had been listening to Floyd play for a while. When Floyd finished, Muddy asked, What are you playing? The blues, Floyd replied. No, young man. It's a blues song, but it ain't the blues. If you really want to play the blues, you got to feel the blues. And you won't feel the blues working here at this highfalutin club up in Harlem. You got to go out and live the blues because the blues is honest and you can't fake it. And only when you personally feel sorrow and pain and play it through your music will it be the blues. And then will you be a real blues man. The spark was lit. Floyd now knew what he had to do. He stayed at the club for another year and saved his money and bought a used pink Cadillac. Then he kissed his grandma goodbye and hit the road heading south to learn as much as he could about the blues. The times being in the middle of the civil rights movement, with riots and demonstrations happening all over the country, when in the South, Floyd did his best to steer clear of the culture that can put him in danger. 
Instead, he played with musicians in small clubs, in small towns, on street corners, in back hollows, in juke joints, and even lone cabins in the woods, learning as much as he could about this sad music of the soul. One night, about 80 miles south of Atlanta, two men pulled off the highway to have dinner at a roadhouse, which happened to feature live music. One man was Lenny Bartell, an entertainment publicist. The other was Frank Feldman, head of the largest talent agency in the country. Floyd was entertaining the audience as they entered. The minute the publicist and the talent agency saw Floyd and heard his blues-style music, they knew he was special. By the time Floyd finished his set, Frank Feldman decided to sign him to his agency. Before the evening was over, Floyd became the latest performer represented by Associated Artists, where their performers become stars. Understanding the value of Floyd's look and sound, Lenny Bartell agreed to do his publicity and make him a media darling. He immediately dubbed him the Pink Blues Man. In the 1960s in the Deep South, racial tension between the cops and black residents were at a dangerous level. After three years on the road learning about the blues, but avoiding them, Floyd knew all the less traveled back roads where he was less likely to be stopped. This night, when he finished his gig at midnight, instead of going to the nearby motel that would give him a room, he decided to drive the long stretch of empty road to the next town where he was booked to play. There wasn't a car or a house in sight. He hoped to get out of Mississippi before dawn. He was driving along on this lonely road when his headlights suddenly picked up the image of a man. He was sitting on the side of the road playing the drums. Floyd slowed down as he got closer. The drummer slowed down his drumming and looked to see who was driving. Floyd stopped his car right in front of the drummer. At the same time, the drummer stopped playing and stuck out his right thumb, which meant he was looking for a ride. Floyd thought, it'd be nice to have someone to talk to, and the man is a musician, so he opened the passenger door. The drummer sees Floyd's guitar and thinks to himself, an albino musician? Wow, my luck is about to change. So he piles his drums in the back seat and jumps into the car in what seems like an instant. They drove along in silence for less than a mile. Then the drummer took out his drumsticks and started beating a soft-like tempo on the dashboard. Which way are you going, Floyd asked. The drummer pointed with his drumsticks straight ahead. He then started to beat a fast rhythm on the dashboard. When he stopped drumming, Floyd asked, How far are you going? The drummer just shrugged his shoulders and drummed a slower, more rhythmic beat. After a while, nearing Floyd's destination, the drummer changed his beat to a rat-a-tat-tat, and then he suddenly stopped and blurted out, My name is Claude Lawson, but please call me Knuckles. I don't speak much, but if you listen to my drumming, you will know exactly what I'm saying. And Knuckles beat out a rhythm on the dashboard. Floyd was intrigued. He realized how lucky he was to meet up with a musician in the middle of the woods, and they were in sync. Floyd knew immediately that he and the drummer were traveling in the same direction to the same place, wherever that might be. Claude Lawson had been playing with a small blues band at a popular bar in Oxford, Mississippi, population 25,000. He was known throughout the area for his drumming style. Sometimes he used his bare knuckles to get a unique sound, and that's how he became known as Knuckles. Why Knuckles doesn't speak? Well, that's a whole other story. You see, one night when Knuckles was a young teenager, while driving with his dad, they were pulled over for a traffic stop. First, the cop broke his taillight, and then he gave his dad a ticket for having a broken taillight. When his dad protested, it led to a verbal back and forth that enraged the cop even more. Finally, the cop pulled out a gun and shot him in cold blood. He then turned to the terrified boy and said, I'm only going to say this to you once. 
don't you ever say a word about this or you could be next. That was Mississippi and the cop was exonerated of all the charges. So traumatized for a long time, Knuckles wouldn't speak with anyone. It was the drums that saved his life. Getting back to Floyd and Knuckles, for years, wherever Floyd was booked, Knuckles accompanied him. They played their music all over the country. Eventually, Floyd, with Knuckles, returned to the Big Apple where the jazz scene was hot. They played with all the major cats of the time. Their after-hour jam sessions were legendary and went on all night. A week before their scheduled gig at the Baby Grand, one of the hottest clubs in Harlem, Floyd and Knuckles stopped by to talk logistics with a Henry Robbins, the club owner, who everybody called Uncle Henry. The floor show was in progress just as they walked in, so they immediately went to the reserve ringside table and sat down quietly. And there she was, on stage. Little Bessie Green, a pint-sized young lady with a five-octave range, belting out, Love Ain't Nothing But The Blues. In a magazine story, Floyd explains, I didn't know what came over me. I couldn't believe that such a little lady could have such a powerful voice. She made me feel like she was singing just to me. I was in a trance. I don't even remember, but I was told that I stood up, walked on stage, and headed straight into a spotlight. And when I snapped back into reality and realized where I was standing, Knuckles, watching my back, handed me my guitar and I joined Bessie in the song. Our duet brought the house down. Bessie Green was the tiniest baby born in Harlem General Hospital. But it wasn't her size so much as her melodic way of crying that separated her from the other screaming infants in the maternity ward. The very first sounds out of her mouth were melodic and joyous. By the time Bessie was five, she was a soloist in the church choir. Bessie's daddy died when she was a baby, and her mama, the widow Green, got a job cleaning the studios at Red Note Records to pay the bills. Widow Green took Bessie with her when she worked. Little Bessie loved going to Red Note Studios, where she could sing and dance along with the music she heard being recorded. One day, Noah Johnson, a record producer, spotted Bessie's antics and was so impressed with her harmony, he invited her to join the session in progress as a backup singer. From then on, Bessie's dream was to be the lead singer in a band. The Widow Green recognized Bessie's God-given gift, but she didn't approve of the lifestyle of musicians. So not wanting to hold her back, when Bessie was 15 and under her watchful eye, she let her perform in nightclubs. By the time Bessie was 18, the buzz was out that she was slated for stardom. Uncle Henry wanted to book her at the Baby Grand. Earlier today, Uncle Henry continued, I got a call from Dinah Washington's manager. He told me she had to cancel because of a sore throat. I've known the Widow Green since I was a boy, and I promised her that I would book Bessie if there was a cancellation. Because Dinah canceled at the last minute, I needed an answer on the spot, and I promised Bessie I would look after her the way her mama always did when she performed. So Bessie said, yes. Just then, Bessie appeared at the table to say goodnight. Ignoring Uncle Henry's warning about Bessie's mama, Floyd stood up, put out his hand, and said, Hi, I've never heard a voice like yours before, and he invited her to join them for a drink. Bessie graciously declined the drink, but she did sit down. During their small talk, Bessie asked Floyd what he was up to. He told her about his quest to play the blues and travel the country to share his music. Bessie confided that her dream was to be the lead singer in a blues band. Ignoring Uncle Henry's warning, Floyd asked Bessie if she would consider being the lead singer in his blues band. Without hesitation, 
With a grin from ear to ear, Bessie replied, yes. Beaming, Floyd said, boy, I was lucky to catch your show tonight. No, you have no idea how lucky it was for me, she replied. And Knuckles beat out a rhythm on the table as Uncle Henry shook his head in dismay. Floyd, Knuckles, Uncle Henry, and Bessie hung out until Floyd and Knuckles had to leave. They were going to Small's Paradise to a jam session. Why don't you come along and listen, he invited Bessie and Uncle Henry. Every top jazz and blues artist in town will be there, Floyd said. Seeing Bessie's enthusiasm, Uncle Henry, who was an avid jazz fan, always wanted to be at one of these legendary sessions and escorting Bessie made it all possible. So he called Bessie's mama to explain why she would be late coming home and not to worry. He would look after her. 3 a.m. Small's Paradise, the hottest after-hours jazz spot in Harlem. And one by one, the who's who of jazz arrived. Dizzy, Monk, Miles, the Duke, the Count, Prez, Lady Day, B.B., Fats, and even Bird were among the most creative jazz artists of that time, all in one room creating musical history. Bessie was blown away by what she saw and heard that night. She could hardly believe that her dream of being a lead singer in a band was about to come true. Around 6 a.m., one of the cats admitted he was tired, and they called it a session. Uncle Henry had to leave to lock up the baby grand, and Floyd and Knuckles agreed to escort Bessie home. Uncle Henry was assured that she was safe with them. Bessie, Floyd, and Knuckles were on the street, adjusting their eyes to the early morning light, when they heard the most melodious saxophone riff coming from an apartment across the street from Small's Paradise. They saw this big mama sitting on a stool, playing a saxophone, accompanied by five kids singing harmoniously to put the youngest to sleep. Ruby's story begins on a cold and snowy night in Los Angeles, a one-time phenomenon that's never been repeated. Six-month-old baby Ruby was left atop a garbage can in the alley behind the Black and Tan Club, the leading black nightclub in L.A. By chance, she was found by blues musician Mississippi Minnie, who came out for a smoke. When she discovered the baby and picked her up, Minnie's motherly instincts kicked in and she decided to keep the baby as her own. She named her Ruby because of the ruby red bow she wore in her hair. Throughout her childhood, Ruby suffered from terrible nightmares. One night, Ruby's screams woke up everyone in the boarding house. No one could comfort this unhappy child until a dapper gentleman appeared at her bedside. He put a small saxophone mouthpiece between her little lips, and out came one long, glorious, tortured note. And then another, and another, until Ruby fell into the sleep of angels. She's got a pair of lungs that will only get better with age. Have a look me up when she turns 18, the, the gentleman said, and placed his card on the table before departing. Minnie picked up the card and read, Louis Jordan and the Timpani Five. As a young child, the saxophone mouthpiece was Ruby's pacifier. After a few mournful notes, she'd fall right to sleep, and she never had those nightmares again. When she was older, Minnie gave her a real saxophone, which Ruby played night and day. Ruby was a natural. Ruby grew up playing sax and singing in Minnie's band. On her 18th birthday, Minnie gave Ruby his card and told her, it's time, go see him. Louis Jordan was not disappointed with what he heard or saw. He hired Ruby on the spot and renamed his band Louis Jordan and the Timpani Six, number six being Ruby. Ruby liked playing with the cats in the band. After all, Ruby was a young girl feeling her oats and traveling with Louis Jordan and five of the coolest musicians in the country. At different times, she fell in love with every one of them and had a kid with each. And when the cat moved on, 
the children were left with Ruby. Ruby once said that if she ever wrote her autobiography, this chapter would be called Trouble is a Dude. But she has no regrets, and as she put it, I got six kids who love me, and that's six times more loving than a woman who ain't got no one. When the youngest was still an infant, Ruby decided it was time to explore a new kind of music. So she packed up her brood and came to New York. Ruby and the older kids, all gifted musically, played their instruments and danced on the crowded city street corners. They passed a hat for rent for their tiny one-room apartment across the street from Small's Paradise. Back to our story. It was just about sunrise when the jam session ended, and Floyd, Knuckles, and Bessie got to the street. The street noise was keeping Ruby's youngest from falling asleep. Ruby was just finishing a tune on her sax with the other kids providing vocal harmony. Nothing seemed to soothe this crying child. Ruby reached into the pocket of her tent dress and pulled out a tiny saxophone mouthpiece, placed it in the baby's mouth like a pacifier, and the child blew one long mournful note, then another, and then fell asleep. Floyd walked straight up to the open window and tapped on the windowsill to get Ruby's attention. As the story goes, she ran up to the window and whispered, Shh! What's the matter with you? It's taken me four songs to put this child to sleep, and you almost woke him up. I didn't mean to disturb you, Floyd said apologetically, but I was so blown away by your playing. Can you also sing backup? Listen, sugar, I can sing backup and diaper my baby without missing a beat. Floyd laughingly introduced himself, Bessie, and Knuckles to Ruby. By the time it took for the sun to come out and heat up the streets, Ruby joined the group. Floyd's group was complete. This was the luckiest break Ruby had since she and her kids moved to the big city. Floyd and Knuckles drove Bessie home. As they promised Uncle Henry, they walked her to her front door. At that moment, the door opened, and there stood Mama Green. After an awkward moment of silence, and before Bessie could say anything, Mama Green said, Uncle Henry called me. He told me everything. Then to Floyd, she said, What a pleasure it is to meet you, Mr. Watkins. I've heard your music and also that you are a gentleman with a lot of talent. And while you're here, I want to say I knew this day would come when Bessie goes for her dream. What I didn't know is how I would feel. Well, I trust that she's in good hands with you, and I believe this is the time for my daughter's dream to come true. Speechless with gratitude, Bessie grinned from ear to ear. Floyd and the group spent months writing new lyrics and music and rehearsing. When they were a tight act, Floyd asked his agent, Frank Feldman, to set up a tri-state tour. He asked his publicist, Lenny Bartell, to let the people know where Floyd's group will be playing. With everything in place, the Pink Bluesman bought a pink bus so that he, Bessie, the little lady with the big voice, Knuckles, the drummer who speaks without talking, and Big Mama Ruby, her sax and six kids, could travel together wherever they were booked. Floyd's group was playing the clubs and festivals in the New York State area when Bessie's mama, the Widow Green, asked her daughter and her musician friends to perform at a groundbreaking fundraiser for a new church. Bessie, ever so grateful to her mama for supporting her dream, instantly said, Of course, mama, we'd love to. And Floyd wrote a special inspirational song for the occasion. When Floyd and his group arrived at the church's construction site for the benefit, the church choir had just begun their final medley with an inspiring gospel recital. It was followed by the church swing band, and as the featured act, Floyd's group was scheduled to close the show. But just before the swing band was on its third song, and Floyd's group was cued to be up next, 
Mama Green's former employer at Blue Note Records, Noah Johnson, now the head of A&R, showed up. He came to hear grown-up Bessie sing. Accompanying him was one of his clients, Lena Horne, the performer, actress, dancer, and leading civil rights activist. Meanwhile, backstage, Floyd's group waited for their turn to go on. Finally, the group headed for the stage. Bessie led the way. But just as she was about to step out on stage, she looked out at the audience, saw her mama, and then recognized Noah Johnson. When Bessie saw who was sitting with him, the iconic Lena Horn, she froze. Knuckles and Ruby walked right past onto the stage, not noticing anything. And Floyd, not paying attention to where he was going, smacked right into her. Come on, let's go, he urged. But Bessie didn't move. She stood frozen on the spot. Floyd wasn't sure what to do next, so he tried shaking her. But she didn't budge. He tried talking to her, but she wasn't listening. Well, not knowing what else to do, Floyd leaned over and kissed her, a soft, lingering kiss on her lips. She blinked heaved a sigh, and stared into Floyd's eyes, but she still didn't move. Floyd kissed her again, and this kiss seemed to release her from the trance, and suddenly Bessie not only unfroze, you might say, it lit a fire in her. She went on stage and gave the best performance of her life. Opening with their new song, Ruby started clapping and the audience joined in. Then, one by one, the crowd was on their feet, dancing and singing along. When they finished their set, Floyd's group got a standing ovation. Shouts of, Encore! Encore! filled the air. Floyd looked at the audience. Everyone was applauding and joyfully hooting. It was awesome. So they played their new song again. Everyone left the benefit humming the song and feeling good. Immediately after the show, Noah Johnson came up to Bessie and gave her a big hug. You've certainly grown into a sensational singer, he complimented, and then offered Floyd's group a recording contract. It was a lucky break for everyone. It looked like Floyd's group was on a road to sure success. Lena, Bessie, and Ruby became fast friends. Lena Horn had just ended her three-year, one-woman show on Broadway and was about to begin a multi-city tour. When they said goodbye, the girls all promised to stay in touch. When, then, Ruby went home with her kids and Knuckles passed out in Floyd's pink Cadillac, leaving Floyd and Bessie alone together for the first time. Their eyes met and their hands touched. There definitely was a spark between them earlier that evening, but Floyd quickly broke the mood and suggested that he get her home. Bessie stayed with her mama when not on the road with the band, and Floyd didn't want to give Mama Green any reason to stop Bessie from living her dream. The group's new song was recorded and released locally. It was a crossover sensation. DJs from the top R&B, gospel, top 40s, top 20s, top 10, and jazz radio stations all played the single in rotation. Before long, it was a number one hit in New York, Los Angeles, and cities in between. Frank Feldman, their agent, arranged a New York concert at the iconic Randall's Island Stadium to kick off a countrywide tour with Floyd's group as the headliners. The concert was sold out in six hours. Lenny Bartell, their publicist, got them cover stories in Time, Newsweek, and other important magazines. The Sunday before the concert, Floyd's group was scheduled to appear on the Ed Sullivan Variety Show, one of the top-rated television shows on the air at that time. It was still three weeks before the big concert. Floyd and Knuckles jammed the nights away in different clubs with different musicians. One night, coming home from a jam session on Long Island, they missed the dimly lit sign for the turnoff for the Long Island Expressway and ended up in rich, very Long Island. 
one of the most affluent zip codes in the country. Suddenly, a cat darted across the car's path. To avoid hitting the kitty, Floyd swerved the car, lost control, and hit a fire hydrant, which broke off cascading water into the air. From out of nowhere came the flashing lights of police cars and cops with their guns drawn. Floyd knew they were in trouble when he realized that Richberry was the Long Island town that had been in the news for being the epic center for white nationalists. While on tour, especially down south, the group made sure to avoid towns like this. Floyd's worst fears were confirmed when the first thing one of the cops yelled at them was, what the hell are you black boys doing in this town? The cops searched Floyd and found several loose joints in his pocket. When ordered to put his hands behind his back, Floyd, tired and high, swung his arms around, lost his balance, and as he fell, he accidentally hit one of the cops in the face. In retaliation, all the cops began to beat up on him. Knuckles jumped into the fray and tried to protect his friend. The cops started beating up on Knuckles too. Floyd and Knuckles were handcuffed and tossed into the police van. When word got out to the press as to who they were, media arrived on the scene. After all, this was big news. The next day, along with their mugshots, headlines in all the major newspaper were tabloid explosive. Some stories were salacious, some were demeaning, few were sympathetic. Floyd's pink Cadillac was hauled down to the police station to be held as evidence. When they searched the car, they found a kilo brick of marijuana in the trunk. Of course, Floyd had no idea how it got there. But as a result of all the bad publicity, their concert and television appearances were canceled. The radio stations then stopped playing their record. All the wonderful stories that were about to break in the media were pulled. Everyone was speculating, would this be the end of Floyd's group? Tried before an all-white jury on multiple trumped-up charges, including drug dealing, Floyd and Knuckles were found guilty of all charges. An unsympathetic judge sentenced them to 20 years in prison. All because Floyd hit a fire hydrant to avoid hitting a cat in the wrong town at the wrong time. It looked like the luck of the albino musician had run out. The judge allowed Floyd and Knuckles 15 days to get their affairs in order. On day 13, which was a Friday, the realization of their pending separation hit Bessie. She feared she would lose Floyd forever. When she confessed her dread to Floyd, he realized his love for her and said, Let's get married. That way we'll be united until death do us part. So they exchanged marriage vows on the construction site of the still unfinished church, the scene of their greatest triumph. After the ceremony, Ruby offered a toast to the new couple. In the middle of speaking, she suddenly stopped. With tears in her eyes, Ruby said, I don't want this to be the end of Floyd's group. Hearing her, Floyd, Bessie, and Knuckles join Ruby to take another vow that Floyd's group will be again. They believed in their music and each other and knew that their hit song was only the beginning. The next morning, after Floyd and Bessie celebrated their vows at the One Way Inn, Floyd and Knuckles reported to the authorities to begin their long prison sentence. Sing Sing Prison while in the worst prison in the state, the hardened blacks in the prison gangs formed to protect their fellow inmates rejected Floyd the albino because he was too white. And as a man of few words, Knuckles was constantly taunted trying to get him to speak. They had no one to protect them. The other gangs were free to abuse these two without any fear of retribution. When Bessie and Ruby visited the boys in prison, neither Floyd nor Knuckles told them about their misery. And when Bessie and Floyd had their private moments together, 
She convinced Floyd she was doing great. Ruby, on the other hand, told Knuckles the truth. Knuckles knew he couldn't talk to Floyd about the ladies and their real struggles, personal and money problems. He wrote about this bad stuff in a journal, which he hid from Floyd. One day, by accident, Floyd came across Knuckles' secret hiding place and, curious, read the journal. In a moment of sadness and madness, he burnt it. All that was spared was one page, and on it it said, Widow Green had died, and in her grief Bessie was drinking more and singing less. Floyd's grandma also passed. His mama had cancer, and his dad had early stages of dementia. Floyd felt helpless. His guilt for not being able to be there when he was needed most was overwhelming. Floyd sat down on the floor of his cell, reached for his guitar, and started to strum. As the strumming picked up to a frantic speed, he created sounds Knuckles said he never heard before. He said Floyd's guitar wept. He felt Floyd's sadness and despair. On the upside, the prison had an orchestra. And when the head of the prison orchestra found out that Floyd and Knuckles were inmates, he invited them to join. And this was the boy's salvation. As it turned out, the white, black, Latino, and Asian gang members liked their music and agreed to protect Floyd, Knuckles, and the other guys in the orchestra so they could play. A lucky break making music with an albino musician. In the meantime, Ruby's oldest son was working as a volunteer with the Freedom and Justice Foundation. He was able to interest his boss into helping Floyd and Knuckles get a new and fair trial. Through exhaustive investigation, they learned that the arresting officer in Floyd's case was also the head of the local KKK and that he planted a kilo brick of marijuana in the trunk of Floyd's Cadillac. When four of the other cops recanted their description of the arrest and all recanted their testimony about Floyd trying to escape, a media campaign was created to get public opinion to pressure the courts into releasing them. Groups picketed Richbury City Hall, the DA's office, and the offices of the local TV news stations and newspapers. They kept this up for months. Word spread. The cause fit in with the message of the Civil Rights Movement. Eventually, fans of Floyd's group started picketing at the White House. It was during this heated time in the U.S. that Lena Horne was invited to the White House to receive a Medal of Freedom Award from the President. As she drove up to the White House, she saw the crowds waving signs that read, Free the Pink Blues Man and Knuckles. Black Lives Count. She was aware of what happened to Floyd and Knuckles and knew that this was the right moment to do whatever she could to help her friends. Following the award ceremony, when she had the president's ear, Lena Horne told the president about the cruel racial injustices perpetrated on Floyd and Knuckles. He promised to look into a pardon. Several months later, Floyd and Knuckles were called to the warden's office together. We have just gotten word that you both received a presidential pardon. As of this moment, you are free men. Good luck. On the train ride back to the city, Floyd reflected on his life and recalled his meeting as a young man with blues man Muddy Waters. He now fully understood the meaning of the words. If you want to play the blues, you have to feel the blues. The blues is honest and you can't fake it. To be a real blues man, you have to take your sorrow and pain and play it through your music so that others can feel what you feel. Then, and only then, will you be a real blues man playing genuine blues. He was interrupted from his thoughts when the conductor shouted, Grand Central Station, everybody off. Ruby and Bessie were waiting when Floyd and Knuckles got off the train. They had a lot of reconnecting to do. They celebrated for a week, and then they got down to business. At the first rehearsal, everybody was nervous. It had been almost 20 years since they all played together. They all shared the same fear. 
What if I'm not as good as I used to be? What if the magic's gone? The years had changed them. The band started with their hit song, but it didn't sound the same. Floyd's heart sank. He signaled to stop. He stared into space for a few minutes and then signaled to start again. A one, a two, a one, two, three, four. This time, when Floyd strummed his guitar, the music exploded. One by one, the others picked up on the energy, and they too poured their souls into their instruments. As they played, the sounds got better and better. They were playing real blues, and Floyd knew for certain that he was a real blues man. When Floyd stopped playing, tears fell from his eyes. He looked at his group and thought, how lucky I am to have friends like these. Now it's time to prove to the world that Floyd's group is not a one-hit wonder. But that's not the end of the story. Floyd's group spent months rehearsing. They were tight and ready to show the world who they were. But the music business had changed. Everybody in it was young, and they viewed Floyd as an old man with an old dream. Floyd's group persisted. Acting as his own agent, Floyd booked the group into small clubs in and around New York City. Within the music business, there was a lot of buzz about Floyd's new music. One night, when Floyd's group was performing at the Jazz Spot Cafe in Greenwich Village, an older, dapper gentleman entered the club and quietly sat down in the back. When the show ended, he sent a note backstage addressed to Floyd. Let's talk. Signed, Lenny Bartell. P.S. I'm sitting in the back of the house. After reading the note and without saying a word to the others, Floyd went directly to Lenny's table. A nervous laugh, a quick hug, Floyd and Lenny sat down. Floyd hadn't heard from Lenny, his former publicist, for all the years he was away. After apologizing for not staying in touch, Lenny told Floyd that he took over Frank Feldman's agency and now books music acts all over the country in over a hundred venues. Lenny said he heard the buzz about the group's new music and came to hear for himself. He said he was blown away. If you and your group are interested in rebuilding what was lost, I can help you. Because you had one of the biggest selling hits in the record business, I can set up a national tour. With your distinctive style of blues and your unique look, you'll fill arenas. You know, if you open your act with your mega hit to remind the audience who you are and then play your new blues, the audience will just love you. They'll buy your CDs. Well, are you up for it? Without answering Lenny, Floyd took him by the arm and led the way backstage. When they entered the dressing room, Ruby eyed Lenny up and down and then blurted, Well, ain't you a blast from the past? Lenny walked right over to Ruby as he replied, Ruby, you haven't changed since we last saw each other at the wedding. How are you and your kids, and what are they up to? They're doing great. The girls married good men and have made me a happy grandma. My oldest son, the one who volunteered for the Justice and Freedom Foundation, went on to graduate from Harvard Law School and works for a major entertainment company. The middle two are professional musicians and are out there earning their dues. And my baby is the road manager for Floyd's group and handles all the logistics and problems on the road. Floyd repeated Lenny's offer for the group to weigh in. Floyd asked them if they'd be interested in headlining shows that can fill arenas and sell their music. When Bessie realized Floyd was serious, a big smile spread on her face. You mean my dream may still be true, she beamed as she squeezed Floyd's hand. Ruby swept up Lenny in her massive arms and danced around the room, and Knuckles replied with a drum beat that expressed the happiness he felt that night. Floyd stepped back for a moment to relish the luckiest break he had had since his release from prison. The tour began within a few months. Every venue where Floyd's group played sold out. 
They rearranged their old mega hit to fit their new style, and Variety declared that a new mega hit as it climbed the charts. Their CDs, printed t-shirts, and other memorabilia were grabbed up at their performances. Their fan base grew with every sold-out performance. Floyd's group was not just a one-hit wonder. They fulfilled their vow. Floyd's group is again. Recently, when Floyd was asked about the old musician superstition that making music with an albino musician brings good luck, he laughed and said, Looking back over my life, I would say it sure does, especially for this albino musician.